Hello, my name is Angus Thompson. I um, trained as a molecular geneticist, but for the last 15 years, I've been working on vaccine acceptance and uptake, uh, working with experts in the fields of uh, human behavior, social and cognitive psychologists, anthropologists and the like. Um, I'm currently principal of Irimi Company, a small boutique consultancy that focuses on supporting uh, countries to raise um, vaccination coverage rates and to, to address vaccine uh, hesitancy. And um, I'm adjunct clinical professor at um, Indiana University, where I have a number of collaborations. So most importantly, first, as we touched upon in the previous interview, where we were looking at the the barriers and facilitators of vaccine acceptance and, and vaccine uptake, uh, we need to understand that health professionals are in almost every context, the most trusted voice on vaccines and vaccination. And that trust is the bedrock of vaccine acceptance and uptake. Therefore, um, we should be thinking about how we can uh, support uh, galvanize and equip health professionals with the skills um, that can help them have these important conversations with their patients about vaccines and have these conversations in a more effective way. So <clears throat> what are the most effective ways of communicating with patients about vaccinations? Um, with Professor John Parrish Sproul at Indiana University, uh, we developed a methodology for interpersonal communication for health professionals. And we came at this uh, through a communication science lens, not a vaccine science lens. Um, the methodology that we call AIMS, A-I-M-S, provides health professionals, in particular with the how of a conversation, but also the what. The how is fundamentally important because the way that we speak with, not at people, has a um, major impact upon their receptivity to what we may want to say to them eventually. Um, if we don't speak to them in the right way, we can actually increase their reactivity, their psychological reactivity, and make them more resistant to what we want to say. When I train health professionals, I often write on, the, on a whiteboard, your facts are wrong. This is often what a health professional says to a patient. You're saying that vaccines may cause multiple sclerosis. I can assure you that vaccines don't cause multiple sclerosis. Your facts are wrong. But often what people hear is not that. And so I cross out facts and I write beliefs or values or identity. Because often when we're talking about vaccines, but when we're talking about many things, when we tell someone that they're wrong, people often hear not that their facts are wrong, but that their beliefs, their values are wrong. So the first step towards speaking to people is to understand that we must build a level of rapport um, with the person and that we must do the things that increase their receptivity to what we're going to say before we say it. The AIMS methodology has four steps. The first step is actually counterintuitively announce. There's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that when a health professional says, it's time for you to have your measles vaccine, they announce vaccination without eliciting any questions. Many, many people just go with it and get vaccinated. So why shouldn't you do that? But if people have a question or a concern, which is in many, many cases perfectly reasonable, then we encourage health professionals to inquire and mirror. Inquiring is all about asking questions to understand better why or where the person is coming from with their concern but it is also a, a, a technique that allows us to build rapport with the person and to make that person feel heard. The mirroring part is we ask permission of the person to repeat back to them what we think we've heard. When that's done effectively, 
And all of this can be done in sec 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes at the most. When we mirror back to the person what we've heard, and if we do it well, then we're not even, we're moving beyond even making the person feel heard to hopefully making them feel felt. We're letting them know that we understand where they're coming from, that we understand their concern and that it's a valid concern. Doesn't mean that we're acknowledging that their concern has validity. We're acknowledging that they have the right to have a concern. Um, then we answer the question or the concern or address the misinformation that the person may have heard. But most importantly, the S of aims is secure trust. We do whatever it takes to ensure that we have increased the trust of that person during the interview and that they leave the clinic with more trust in the health professional than before they arrived, even if they decided to not get vaccinated. Because what we're talking about here is a conversational approach. And in a dialogue, in a conversation, what we say now is affected by what we said the last time and by what we, and it affects what we will say the next time. And so we encourage health professionals to focus on building trust and rapport and not on getting the person vaccinated, which is often quite a relief for the health professionals. Supporting patients first begins with listening to them. It doesn't begin with um, playing a game of fact tennis where um, a patient suggests something and a health professional replies with a, an alternative um, piece of information or fact. It starts with listening to the patients and understanding where their concerns come from, acknowledging that they have the right to have concerns, and then <clears throat> building that rapport and trust and responding to their concerns, hopefully responding to their concerns in a language that they understand. Um, with examples that help them understand um, how science works, how we are constantly monitoring the safety of vaccines, how we um, test the safety of vaccines through the entire development process of a vaccine. I mean, we, we, can, we can easily say that vaccines are probably the most tested um, medical intervention that exists. Um, in production of vaccines, up to 70% of the time spent in production is spent on quality control. So <clears throat> vaccines undergo probably more tests than an aircraft engine. <clears throat> they are very safe. They're not 100% safe, but nothing in life is 100% safe. They are effective against the deadly diseases, in particular against the severe outcomes that we can have from those diseases. But they're not 100% effective, but nothing in life is. These are the kinds of ways that a health professional might want to frame their replies to the patient. But my advice would be to focus on building trust and rapport with the patient and uh, hoping and thereby um, imagining that even if you don't manage to get them to vaccinate in one visit, that investment in the trust um, uh, in the relationship may pay off the next time that you see them. Social networks um, accelerate the spread of mis and disinformation. And um, we've been talking until now about the one-on-one -on -one interaction between a health professional and a patient in a clinic but um, health professionals have an extremely important role to play in helping um, uh, address the, the, the spread of vaccine-related disinformation on media and um, on social media. Um, on media, um, a health professional who speaks with a journalist, as I've already touched upon, is a highly trusted voice and therefore is more likely to be listened to by the journalist and by the audience that that journalist is, is writing for or reporting for. On social media, we talk a lot about mis and disinformation, but we know that a big part of the problem is what we call information gaps or even information voids. Mis and disinformation, and it's important to note the distinction between the two, misinformation is false 
or misleading uh, information that can be confusing, um, uh, obfuscates uh, somebody's search for reliable information. Disinformation is deliberately engineered misinformation. It is deliberately engineered by bad actors who have um, uh, specific uh, malign motivations, so um, often profit. They're looking to monetize the disinformation that they generate, um, sometimes to politicize, uh, to use it to politicize or polarize conversations online. And they use deceitful tactics in the way that they spread that disinformation, create and spread it. So disinformation loves an information void. It, it pours into an information void and occupies the space that should be occupied by reliable information that comes from trustworthy voices. So in the previous interview, we talked about trustworthiness. People get their truths from trustworthy voices. That means voices who are both expert and competent, but most importantly, benevolent or have our best interests at heart. Health professionals are very trustworthy voices. And um, there is a great need for us uh, to mobilize uh, more health professionals onto social networks to give them a voice, to equip them to have a voice so that they fill those voids with trusted information um, for people. So that when people go looking for information, when they go looking for an answer to their question, um, they find those trusted voices providing the information they need rather than disinformation. So the International Pediatrics Association has um, a vaccine trust initiative uh, that includes the AIMS training program that I've already spoken about um, uh, that is available online and is also potentially available in live trainings. Communication training is always better live than online, but that course is already available online. In addition, um, I co-developed a training program for health professionals to get themselves online, to, to create that, to have that voice in social media. That is also part of the International Pediatric Association um, initiative and is also available online. So I think a great starting point is that training program. Anybody can access it. Um, you do need to register, but it's free. Um, and uh, that would be a great first step. Ideally, um, we would see health professionals organizing at a national or subnational level to, to, to actually develop or, or host trainings where their colleagues can be trained uh, live in these techniques. The techniques are not difficult, but live training is always easier. Um, it's a little bit like learning a whole new skill, like learning to drive. When we start, we have to concentrate a lot, but we get better and better at it. What's remarkable is that when we get better at it, I think as you touched upon earlier, um, we can use it not only in our professional lives, but in our personal lives. Um, there's always a need to have the person in front of us more receptive to what we want to say than more reactive. So that's the primary resource. 